I joined the fund in April 2020 at the start of the COVID pandemic. I'm also a member of the Royal Air Force family, having served for almost 35 years retiring from the service after my last role as Chief of Staff Personnel and Air Secretary. It therefore gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this event on a topic close to my heart. The subject of well-being and coping has been under the spotlight for much of the past 20 months or so, but it's something the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund has been aware of over the years as being one of the challenges that serving Royal Air Force personnel face. As professional and personal lives become even busier and entwined, we set out to better understand the well-being and coping mechanisms of personnel of all ranks, professions and ages. We were particularly interested to understand the prevalence of gambling among Royal Air Force personnel as Royal Air Force line managers were confiding in us that they were concerned that gambling was becoming a problem among their people. So we decided to launch a piece of research to explore this, resulting in the first large sample size study of serving military personnel in the world. Our research aims not only to better understand and encourage conversations around gambling and well-being, but to help us effectively work alongside the Royal Air Force to ensure we can support individuals whenever they may need us. In a moment, we'll hear from our research partner, Professor Simon Diamond of Swansea University, who will present the research. You'll then hear from our expert panel members who will take questions that have been submitted by you. Please ask any further questions via the chat function or email them to research at Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund, that's refbf.org.uk. We will endeavour to answer as many as we can. The event will be recorded, so if you lose your connection, there will be an opportunity for you to watch again. Please feel free to join the conversation online too, using the hashtag wellbeing in the REF. So without further ado, Simon, over to you. Many thanks, Chris, and hello, everyone. Um, my name is Simon Diamond. I'm a professor of psychology and behavior analysis here at Swansea University, and I'm just going to be running you through the research study that we've conducted, the findings, and uh, talking a little bit about the recommendations and implications that follow from the, the study's findings. We elected in this particular study to um, focus on the topic of gambling and well-being. Uh, gambling is a public health issue that's of uh, increasing significance here in the UK and indeed internationally. As a public health challenge, it brings with it a series of health harming uh, behaviours um, that affect a wide range of different domains. For instance, someone's finances can obviously be impacted by struggles with the gambling problem, their employment circumstances, their physical and mental health, and their social relationships and familial relationships can all Come under strain if someone is struggling with a gambling problem. It's well known now with accumulating international evidence that military personnel uh, may be at increased risk or increased vulnerability to developing a gambling problem and hence are susceptible to the harms that arise. Um, in this particular piece of research the fund was keen to commission um, a, 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 an approach or a study, a survey of the existing um, challenges confronted by serving members of the Royal Air Force, given some anecdotal comments and anecdotal reports from station commanders that this was in fact an issue that many personnel were, were struggling with. So the study itself fits within a, um, uh, an existing body of literature, um, which is itself quite diverse, yet quite international in, in focus. So, for instance, research of uh, what we know on gambling related harm in the military comes, uh, for instance, from a recent study by Sean Colishaw and colleagues from Australia. And they worked and surveyed around 1300 members of the Australian Defence Force just after returning from deployment. Um, and they surveyed them for their gambling problems using a validated um, clinical instrument called the Problem Gambling Severity Index. And the Problem Gambling Severity Index scores from their sample indicated that approximately 2% were experiencing gambling problems. That's gambling problems that where negative consequences are beginning to be felt in those domains that I mentioned a little bit earlier. They also found that between 
um, or, or approximately 5.7% of their sample um, had scores within the at-risk range. So they were at risk of going on to develop greater problems. Van Mass and Nauer in a study from the United States of America just published last year with 182, um, what they described as military service members, some of whom were on active duty, found at-risk gambling rates of um, approximately 30%, um, again, using the same problem gambling severity index measure. So quite disparate um, results there between the two studies, but the sample sizes are greatly different. Another study from Australia, um, but including personnel from the States and from the UK and from New Zealand by, by Milton and colleagues in two, uh, 2019, found that um, almost a third had gambled in the past year, 40% of serving personnel uh, reported gambling once a week and 6% of personnel had tried to stop. The fund itself commissioned um, a report called the Meeting the Needs Report in 2018. And in that report, um, gambling related questions were asked of several respondents of, the, of the, the sample of respondents. And in total, two and a half thousand currently serving RAF personnel completed those questions, completed the survey, 2% of whom reported having a problem or indeed a major problem with gambling. And that proportion increased to 5% when the um, category of slight problem was included. Unfortunately, that report didn't use the same diagnostic instrument, the problem gambling severity index that the previous studies, uh, most of the previous studies had included. So that was part of the motivation in, in undertaking this piece of work, uh, our research was to conduct a, a reliable and a valid snapshot of the nature and extent of gambling and its impact on well-being in serving personnel. So the survey that we um, designed and carried out was an online, what's called a cross-sectional survey of all serving members of the RAF. Email notifications and calls for participants were, were circulated by uh, um, the fund to station commanders on all bases, etc. We conducted follow-up interviews with selected personnel, a small uh, selected uh, group of personnel. We're not going to be talking about those data here today, but those data are available if you're, if you're interested uh, in discussing them. So the survey began with a series of socio-demographic questions and military service, RAF questions, rank, um, years of service and so on. Participants then moved on to completing questions on their mental health, in particular questions related to anxiety and depression, again using standardised clinical instruments. We also asked about the impact of the COVID-19 restrictions and the impact of the pandemic on their anxiety and depression at that time. Participants then moved on to a gambling participation and activities um, component or activities um, section. And if they had answered yes to participating in gambling within the last year, they went on to complete the Problem Gambling Severity Index and we explored the impact of the pandemic on their gambling. If they hadn't participated in gambling, then they completed the alcohol use measures questionnaires. And again, we explored the impact of the pandemic on their alcohol use. All participants then ended the the survey at that moment. In terms of our findings, we uh, 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 recruited a robust sample of over 2,026 responses, most of whom were male, aged between 35 and 44 um, years of age. Mean age was 38.7. The majority were white British, they owned their own home, and the majority, again, were regulars holding, uh, holding non-commissioned ranks in the RAF. In terms of the gambling findings, we found that um, just under 68% of our sample had gambled within the past year. So those participants went, went on to complete the Problem Gambling Severity Index. The vast majority, 84.3% of whom um, produced scores of um, non-problem gambling status on the PGSI. 2% produced scores indicative of problem gambling with the low risk and moderate risk categories collapsing to approximately 14 percent of the sample so um, two percent uh, were experiencing problem gambling and a combined 14 percent of the sample experiencing some degree of risk from their uh, gambling problems in terms of mental health Depression and anxiety were um, the majority did not experience symptoms of depression. The majority of um, participants did not experience 
uh, symptoms of anxiety. There were, however, um, proportions of personnel experiencing um, uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression from the moderate to severe range across the categories, um, as, as perhaps one might expect with a cross-sectional survey of this kind. In terms of alcohol use, we use the audit to assess alcohol use. Um, the majority of the participants experienced what's called lower risk drinking. There were um, proportions, for instance, 2.4% of the participants experienced what, we, what the audit would describe as possible alcohol dependence. So there was a, a distribution, a, a, um, a fairly orderly distribution across the, the uh, increasing risk levels. In terms of the impact of COVID, Almost half of the, or just, just under half of the respondents reported a deterioration in their mental health as, an, as a result of the pandemic. Almost a third reported an increase in alcohol consumption. And of those personnel whose scores were indicative of problem gambling, just under half had signed up to one or more gambling apps or websites um, during the pandemic. Just under half had also increased the amount of time they spent on gambling. Similarly, just under 35% um, had actually increased the amount of money that, um, that they spent on gambling during the pandemic. We number crunched these data um, to fit into uh, a, a statistical model which allows us to identify potential risk factors that contribute to gambling problems and gambling scores. And we identified six factors that contributed um, um, risk to, in developing a gambling problem. Male gender was almost three times uh, uh, more likely to uh, predict or lead to a gambling problem. If you were aged between 18 and 24, it was two times the risk. Holding a non-commissioned rank was at two and a half times the risk. Similarly, experiencing or drinking at hazardous, hazardous levels um, was two times greater risk of developing a gambling problem. And we found between five um, and 3.5 times the risk related to uh, experiencing symptoms of moderate to severe depression or anxiety. So a clear role between um, sort of military service ranks, socio-demographics and uh, mental health factors in exacerbating the risk or the vulnerability to developing a gambling problem. In summary then, this was the first large sample size study of serving mil military personnel in the world that's used clinically validated measures such as the PGSI to obtain these percentage prevalence estimates. The rates of problem gambling that we found amongst serving RAF personnel were marginally higher than those in the general population. The risk factors for problem gambling that we identified, those six factors, sociodemographic and mental health, may allow for the early identification of who needs help and support the most and indeed when they may need that help and support. There are several implications and recommendations that arise from these findings. The awareness of gambling and potential gambling problems should be raised amongst serving personnel. We should all do what we can to raise the profile of this um, um, public health risk. The screening of gambling problems, especially amongst RAF personnel at particular risk, as identified in our models, should be undertaken. We should provide training to ensure that health professionals in the defence medical services and line managers are aware of the gambling related harms beyond those of financial difficulties and debt um, and of the external gambling support that is available to personnel such as through the National Gambling Treatment Service. We should also provide education and to develop uh, low intensity behaviour change strategies that could be adapted for military context for those at, developing, at risk of developing gambling problems. Um, and broadly, it would be amiss of any academic presenting a piece of research to not uh, orient the need to undertake further research, but further research is indeed needed on what we need to do to overcome barriers to help seeking amongst personnel who may be um, ashamed or reluctant to come forward with a gambling problem and look to see how we can better support them during the transition period, particularly when personnel leave the service. And that's it from me. I'd just like to thank the fund for working with us on this. It's been an absolute pleasure and I really look forward to hearing your questions and comments. This research is about more than statistics. Here are some quotes from the lived experience of people behind those figures.
As Chief of Staff Personnel and Air Secretary, and also as a service person, I have worked closely with the RAF Benevolent Fund throughout my career. I am delighted to be part of an event which focuses on wellbeing and coping during difficult times. The turbulence brought to us by the pandemic underlies how timely it is to launch this research today, the first of its kind, looking specifically at coping mechanisms and the impact of gambling on our people. The study consulted service personnel themselves, and I was pleased to see that it gave them a voice and listened to their lived experiences. Thanks to the considered, thoughtful and insightful responses, the research identified gambling, excessive use of alcohol and poor mental health as key challenges for some of our people. While these issues aren't specific to the Royal Air Force, I am conscious that our people regularly face challenging situations which can exacerbate the risks. I am delighted that the Royal Air Force is working with the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund to identify problems earlier, support those in need, and importantly, reduce the stigma of seeking support around gambling, depression, and anxiety. The RAF Health and Wellbeing Strategy, which was launched last year, recognises the importance of promoting financial resilience and wellbeing within our people, as it helps improve their employability, increase their deployability, and enhance their own personal resilience. We're always looking to learn and adapt to make sure that we provide the right climate for our people to be able to thrive. Today is a great opportunity for us to be able to do that. Thank you, Maria, and hello everyone. I'm Alison Wyman from the RAF Benevolent Fund, and I'm delighted to chair our panel session today. We are live, so please cross your fingers that our internet connections hold. Uh, today's research launch is significant to me. I've worked alongside colleagues on this project since its inception for well over a year, um, and I'm hopeful that these findings can provide insight into an area of increasing interest and concern and make a real difference to the well-being of serving personnel. I think we should recognise that the Royal Air Force is the first service to be proactive and willing to explore gambling amongst people in this way. Um, and we've been pleased to be able to work with the RAF on this. Um, we've also been delighted to have worked with leading organisations such as GAMCARE to start providing training to RAF welfare staff. So work has already begun in this area, um, but there's clearly more that can be done. So to understand the research and its findings in more detail and the implications of this, please let me introduce our panel to you. We have Air Vice Marshal Maria Byford and Professor Simon Diamond, both of whom you've already met. Um, we are hoping for a third panel member, Justin Larkham, a military veteran and author, um, but we are currently having some technical problems getting him online. So we will press ahead in the hope that he will be able to join us partway through. So we've heard from the presentation of the research findings that it is a minority of serving personnel who are affected by gambling, but the rate is higher than that of the general population. And there's a fairly significant cohort of people in the at-risk group. So it'll be good to talk about that a bit further and get our panel's thoughts on that, um, as well as to ask some questions which you, the audience, have. So if you do have any questions for the panel, please write them in the chat or comment section for the channel you're viewing or email them directly to research at rafbf.org.uk. So Maria, if I could come to you first, um, reflecting on the research findings, do you think we should be concerned that a fairly significant minority of RAF personnel have identified as being at risk of problem gambling? Um, and what do you feel can be done to prevent that group from de developing more serious problems? Um, yeah, um, good afternoon again. And uh, yeah, thank you for your question. So I think if I reflect back, um, gambling is something that I've been personally concerned about for some years um, across the, the whole of the defence population. So a few years ago, I was responsible for the Defence Mental Health Service. And then um, uh, until this role, um, I was also head of RF Medical Services. It's something that I felt was an area that 
um, we needed to look into. And I was absolutely delighted to have conversations about three years ago with the Benevolent Fund about my concerns in this area. Um, and I think the research um, is really valuable in helping us understand um, some of those behaviours in a bit more detail. Um, although I would reflect that um, um, although we do have a number of people we've identified with a potentially um, uh, a risk taking behaviours, um, the only reason it looks higher than the general population is because of the demographic of our service. So the people that are more likely um, to be at risk are, are representative in, in, in the young people that we have in our service. And that's why I think it is a real concern. Um, and it's something that the REL, um, the REF Health uh, and Wellbeing Steering Group have put quite some thought into um, in the launching of the REF Health and Wellbeing Strategy last year, which looks at a number of key priorities. And three of those are actually being discussed this afternoon, which are around um, reducing alcohol intake, mental health and wellbeing and financial wellbeing. These are all really relevant to the strategy. And then the other areas that we also have concerns about are around um, healthy weight and, and good weight management and, uh, and smoking cessation. So I think for us, you know, these are really key factors in ensuring that our people have healthy, positive lifestyles. Um, and, I, and I think it's, you know, absolutely fantastic that we get the opportunity to work with the, with the research and with the Benevolent Fund on this. When we do identify somebody who, with, with a problem, we take it very seriously and we have a number of ways in which we are able to um, support and look after that service person or that family member if it might be one of their family members and we can signpost to our welfare teams we we've got our sort of unit support mechanism as well as um, the great charities including the benevolent fund to help look after our people and of course the national health service also has um, has routes that we can um, we can um, also utilize uh, as well as GAM Care and Gamble Aware that you've already mentioned. So I think there are there are lots of routes. Um, um, and, uh, and as you say, you know, this is something that we do take um, very seriously and we would be concerned about it when identified to us. Mm. Well, thank you, Maria. Um, and I guess you sort of touched on the, the broad range of support um, that you might tap into or that is available. Um, so I guess turning to Simon, we, we heard in your presentation, Simon, that for those experiencing gambling problems, they are often interconnected with broader wellbeing issues such as alcohol use and mental health. Um, and I guess it, it can be quite tempting to think of gambling as a financial problem and to treat it as such. Um, but what would you say in response to that? Thanks. Thanks, Alison. Thanks for the question. Um, I, I, yeah, absolutely. Gambling rarely, if ever, occurs in isolation. It's rare if you're um, developing a problem with gambling, it's highly likely that it's impacting upon other domains of, of your life. So for instance, you can be, it can have an impact, obviously most, most, most discernibly, perhaps in someone's financial management, their debt um, 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 issues, but it can also lead to adverse physical health challenges, mental health challenges. Um, there can be alcohol use issues. One's relationship with others, family and friends can be impacted about the struggle to conceal what is a heavily stigmatized and highly secretive uh, problem. So that can express itself through other uh, means, through other domains. And it's that holistic, um, public health informed approach, which is garnering an awful lot of uh, research interest, or re uh, research focus nowadays that gambling is not uh, a problem to be approached or understood in isolation, but it will be a public health issue that impacts across several different domains. The behaviours that are impacted by someone's gambling problem can um, have serious consequences across numerous different domains. So we would hope that this research can help flag some of those domains that could be impacted if someone is struggling with a gambling problem. So for instance, someone at work is likely to be preoccupied they're likely to be irritable, they're likely to be impatient, and they're likely to be um, all consumed by taking active steps to conceal from others the nature and the extent of their gambling problem. So we, we hope that this research can help people maybe identify and look for and ask a little bit more about things that they may see, um, to ask about their gambling exposure, to just to notice small little um, changes in behavior. Um, because that can help someone 
get the help that they need um, when it's uh, needed the most. Yeah, no, thanks, Simon. And I, I know so one of the recommendations from the research was to increase awareness mm -hmm. of problem gambling among RAF personnel and to be able to spot some, some of those signs and symptoms that you've talked about. Um, Maria, if I could sort of ask you, how do you think we can achieve that in increasing awareness of problem gambling among serving personnel? So I think um, I think we've got lots of ways in which we can communicate the information across um, across the RAF. So, I mean, this is the first step, isn't it? The ability to launch the research. And I think the last chance that I had to look at the YouTube channel, we were definitely north of 100 um, people watching this um, this launch this afternoon. For me, that's the start of our journey working together in order to um, increase awareness um, and to and to communicate really the ways in which we can help people, uh, you know, and all of the things that we've just heard in terms of those changing behaviours that, that, that friends and family may spot around an individual, the more that we can um, share some of that information um, and destigmatise the conversation around it, I think that that's really critical. We've been really successful, I think, in recent years around um, um, making it more acceptable to talk about um, things that affect our mental health and our well-being. Uh, and I think we should continue to, you know, keep that conversation going and, and ensure that people um, feel able to reach out for help or actually others just become more aware if they notice those changing behaviours um, in those that they might be working with, um, live with, socialise with, you know, and are able to, to, to perhaps, you know, um, um, pr point them in the right direction towards getting some help. Mm. No, thanks, Maria. Um, and I guess so coming back to you, Simon, because you, you mentioned um, earlier about the recommendations and one of the recommendations being to develop low intensity behaviour change strategies um, for those who are at risk. Can you elaborate a bit further on what that might look like, what that might mean? Absolutely. Um, th there is growing interest in, in the research and clinical um, gambling world about the potential transition or the trajectories by which people who are deemed to be at risk or at low to moderate risk of, of developing a gambling problem, the, the extent to which they may then go on to develop um, um, greater Problem. So we don't know enough yet about that journey, but we do know from um, related clinical interventions and clinical approaches that brief psychotherapeutic interventions at that moment in time with an at-risk vulnerable group can have significant consequences at reducing their risk threshold, at reducing their capacity to, to, to get into greater difficulty. So um, that there's numerous methods that, that people can undertake, some of which um, come under the auspices of a responsible gambling or industry, um, um, sponsored industry-led interventions about cooling off periods and deposit limits and so on and so forth. Jury's out on, on a lot of the um, um, efficacy of some of those interventions, but family and friends can often provide the greatest sources of support, the greatest uh, boost to someone's struggles just by sharing it with them so i think um obviously re more research is needed it'd probably be a miss of me as, a, as an academic to say that all the research on this is done we all need to go home but hopefully this is the start of that research journey and, and um at developing a, a stronger evidence base to inform and guide these these ostensibly brief interventions for those at risk mm. and i guess that this research it was specifically looking at raf personnel um, but again, so for you, Simon, I think, do you think there are messages here that would be applicable to the other services? And if so, how might the MOD take them forward? Absolutely, that there's no reason why these findings or indeed the, the implications of these findings should be restricted to, to one service. And I think the RAF Benevolent Fund are to be applauded for their um, bravery and their commitment and their motivation to taking on this survey and to undertaking research on the nature and the extent of the, the gambling problems within the RAF. Um, it is incumbent upon us now to extend this research to the other services and look to see if there's individual occupation specific factors which may predispose people to get into greater difficulties within those services. Um, we simply do not know enough about that internationally and I think there's a huge opportunity here for the RAF and the Ministry of Defence more generally to, to lead the way on this. There's some indication that the MOD is willing to um, consider a, a regular um, screen for gambling as part of the annual 
um, attitude survey and we certainly hope that that gets um, written into the armed forces bill that would be a step in the right direction yeah absolutely uh now i understand we may possibly have justin justin can you see and hear me i can't hear justin so it looks as though we've half got him <laughs> so i will carry on with the with the questions for simon and Maria. Um, so the questions are starting to come through from our audience, which is great. Um, so there's a question that's come in as an email. Um, Maria, perhaps you could take this one. So now that we have this research, what do you see as the challenges ahead? Um, um, so I, I think in respect of the research, the challenges probably remain the same, you know, and um, and I think I've already touched on you know, some of the challenges that we have in supporting our people through uh, challenging careers. Um, and I think the research, you know, has identified that some of the demands that we put on people through service life, um, um, we ask them to do um, difficult things, often um, separated from their family. And their uh, and their everyday support networks back in back at home in order to deploy to take assignments or irregular shift patterns and irregular work patterns and all of those put stresses on our people which is why going back to the RAF health and well-being strategy it's really critical that we have these priorities that we need to um, that we need to consider um, and it's not just um, a personnel function although I'm speaking as Chief of Staff personnel. This is actually, for me, it's a, it's a leadership responsibility. It's a ch chain of command responsibility in how we how we will take this research and the other information that we've got forward in looking after our people, um, and not just our people, but their people too. So their friends, their family, and the communities around them. For me, this is all about how we sustain the force and how we and how we build the next generation Air Force. So, you know, how we look after our people and the things that, that are important to them in order to ensure that they have a healthy and fulfilling service life yeah, and retirement. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I guess you're talking about sort of retirement and um, being a veteran. So um, some of us will be aware that there was um, a study or research released um, indicating that veterans are significantly more likely to experience problem gambling compared to non-veterans, but among serving personnel, it seems to be the at-risk group that, that's more significant than the problem gambling group. Um, Simon, a question for you that, that's come in. How similar was this study, the one we've just done, um, to the veterans one in terms of methodology and results? This, this study was similar um, to the extent that we used many of the same clinical diagnostic instruments, for instance, the problem gambling severity index and our measures of mental health were similar in this study as they were in the veterans project. Now, I suppose the difference is in terms of the cohorts. We had one um, representative cohort of over 2000 servicemen and women from the RAF in this particular study, whereas in the veterans project, we first recruited as many veterans as we could find across the UK from all different veterans of all different services and then recruited age and gender matched non-veterans to sort of control for just veteran status being the, being the significant factor there. So it's many of the same methods, which I think adds strength to the um, findings. It adds uh, power, I think, and uh, uh, onus to the implications of the findings that the similar methods across these two quite distinct samples and populations can, be, um, uh, can reveal similar uh, vulnerabilities. And another question sort of come in in relation to the, the research itself. Um, so the, the question that's come in is that the, the sample size is a fairly small percentage of the RAF. So how do we know that it is reliable and representative and that we can um, sort of infer anything from it? Uh, absolutely. Um, we'd always like to have more people in our in our sample sizes to, to um, uh, pour them through the statistical models that we construct. Um, this is the single largest sample sized study of its kind though. So let's let's bear that in mind. No other study of serving personnel across the world has recruited more than 2000 active serving members 
of um, of a military service to participate in a project like this. So I think that 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 stands uh, on its own on merits. But to draw implications from survey findings such as this, uh, we weighted the findings as is commonplace in all survey uh, research. So you, we, we weighted it by some demographic factors such as age and gender to ensure that the 2000 or so RAF personnel were representative of the main RAF population. So we can have reasonable confidence that this is a snapshot, but a representative snapshot of the problems faced by RAF personnel. Mm, that's great, thank you. Um, so another question that has come in. Um, so I get the sort of questions come, that has come in talks about how we're starting to get quite a useful body of knowledge of the health and well-being impact of gambling. So through this research, through the veterans research, um, can the panel say any more about screening and signposting improvements? Um, perhaps, Maria, I could come to you first. Um, I think I might struggle on that question. That might be one for Simon, actually, if you don't mind, Alison. I'm not sure I'm, I'm qualified to answer that one. OK, Simon, I'm happy to come to you. Uh, sure, happy to, happy to oblige. Um, we need to screen, simple as that. We need to screen regularly in, in, in annual um, health and wellbeing surveys, in the um, Armed Forces Continuous Attitude Survey, for instance, might be one way in which we could obtain information like this in relation to other addictions. Um, to a screening question need not be terribly onerous, and obviously um, it needs to be embedded within a whole set of other questions, but a, a simple two-question um, gambling screen can indicate people who may be at risk of, of getting into greater difficulty. That wouldn't take too long to administer. Um, there's plenty of, of uh, researchers such as myself who'd be happy to oblige with the analysis of those findings, and it would also um, give people who may be struggling a voice, who may for that first time in that anonymized context be able to um, raise their hand and indicate that they may be struggling a problem, so struggling with a problem. So screening needs to be undertaken, and then the results of that screening um, fed back to health and well-being strategy. Yeah, and I guess it's sort of come up a bit about the stigma and the fear around disclosing gambling problems. And one of the questions that has come in is in relation to the fact that it's sort of generally understood that gambling is prohibited if you're serving. Um, what proactive steps can the services take to destigmatize coming forward to talk? I mean, Maria, what, what would you like to see in, in that respect in terms of people feeling that they can come forward? How, how would you think we might be able to achieve that? So I think that um, anything that we can do to um, to take stigma out of um, people's concerns about mental health, well-being, risky behaviours is really important. So um, so those those of uh, those of us that have been serving have been aware of really for the last um, um, five years or more the. Um, uh, Defence People Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy talked about how we promote, prevent, treat and detect um, um, mental um, mental health concerns. Um, and we've all got a role and responsibility in that, in all of those sort of four elements of the uh, of the action plan around that. Um, so I see I see this as is is one of those fragments within that overall health and wellbeing holistic approach that we're taking towards our people going forwards um, and I think that um, and anything that we can do to encourage people to feel that they can ask for help um, can be open about their their concerns their problems all the concerns problems they have about other people have got to be positives in terms of having a healthy um, um, and um, uh, mentally and physically fit force for the future so so I, I kind of see it as one of the strand of many things that we need to encourage our people to be honest and open about going forwards yeah no, definitely and a couple more questions that have come through I think that's sort of um very specific to the RAF um so the question is do the RAF have firewalls preventing personnel accessing gambling websites um on RAF or MOD hardware and then the second bit of the question is, there are still um, gambling slot machines on some RAF stations, is, and is anything being done to remove those? I think that's probably for you, Maria. So, um, so yeah, uh, the question is, I think it all the, um, yeah, the assertion is absolutely right. So we do, you know, 
if you are at work using MOD information technology systems, you will not be able to access um, gambling sites and um, things like payday loan sites. However, when you're on your own personal device and your own personal time, there are no restrictions on what people can access in 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 those sort of terms. Um, um, as far as um, uh, gambling machines, one arm bandits, those kind of things in place. Um, um, it's been a while since I've been on an officers mess committee, but I certainly remember being the games machine member. But that was about thirty years ago, um, and I know the attitudes towards the, the, those kind of um, uh, forms of entertainment are changing. So, mm -hmm. it, uh, and probably aligned in uh, in our attitudes with other things like uh, smoking on the mm -hmm. RF estate, for example, which we now have a uh, smoke free working estate across the whole of the Royal Air Force. Okay. So I think it's fair to say that um, lots has changed over the 30 years of my career. Um, and I think probably gambling machines are one of those <clears> things that be belong to an RAF of, of decades ago and not the modern RAF of today. Mm, thank you. Yeah. And um, I guess we, we touched earlier about the fact that gambling is related to other issues as well, such as alcohol, mental health. And I know that um, quite a lot of thought and work has gone into addressing some of those issues. Um, I guess, Simon, so a question for you. What analysis has been done to identify the relationship between those three issues, so gambling, alcohol and mental health? An awful lot of um, research has gone into the apparent comorbidity or the co-occurrence of these different um, challenges, these different disorders um, with one another. Um, the sequence or the um, order by which those factors are related is, is still up for debate. So for instance, it's not known whether an alcohol problem directly contributes to a gambling problem or whether it's the other way around or that they tend to co-occur at the same time. People often gamble heavily when they're, when they're drinking heavily. Um, so in terms of understanding that relationship, it's, it's an established relationship. There's high, they're highly comorbid uh, mental health challenges, particularly anxiety and depression that co-occur with the gambling problem. And there's highly comorbid um, alcohol use challenges whilst someone is, str is struggling with a, with a gambling problem. So we're using that knowledge. Again, I'll refer you to, to a point I made a little bit earlier. We can use those behaviors to identify people who may be experiencing harm. So it may be evident that they're a little bit more withdrawn, a little bit more anxious. And again, there could be a gambling problem at the, at the seat of that challenge. So to use our, the knowledge of that existing research to, uh, to identify people when they, when they may need that help. Mm. Thank you. And um, I suppose we sort of, it, it's come up earlier about the fact, I know you mentioned it in your uh, presentation, Simon, about um, men were more likely to be um, problem gamblers than women. Um, so a, a question that's sort of come in is, were female personnel included in the survey? I, I know that they were, um, but how did their results compare to male personnel? Excellent question. They most certainly were included. This was open to all RAF personnel, however they um, identified. Um, we d haven't done a separate sub-analysis of the female um, responses the, or the female uh, gambling activity preferences, for instance. My gut feeling would be that there might be some slight differences. You might see some um, changes in the forms of gambling activities that females may prefer. Um, for instance, males often prefer um, sport betting, um, the faster, more, uh, more addictive forms of, of, of gambling, such as slot machines and so on. Whereas there's some evidence that some of the other more um, uh, skill-based and or bingo type games are often preferred in, in um, different um, uh, populations, such as females. But um, that's a, a fascinating question. I think after this talk, we'll go back and, and have a look at that data, our data set and look to see if there are any interesting trends in that. And another question that's come in, again, very research focused, is about the impact of COVID. And I know in the research, we, we wanted to, to look at that because it was being conducted during the time of COVID. Um, so what can you tell us, Simon, about um, how much COVID has exacerbated any of these issues? It's definitely the, the elephant in the room. It's likely to have exerted a, a, a broad background, maybe a, a sort of a contextual type effect on, on people as they were filling in the survey, as they were getting used to, you know, um, the, the various stages of lockdown or when the research was, was conducted. Um, the international research consensus seems to have been that COVID seems to have um, exacerbated problems 
who were already experiencing or on the way towards experiencing problems prior to COVID. Um, and that resonates in our data in that individuals who are at risk or who are already experiencing problems with gambling um, took out riskier bets, they um, downloaded more apps, they spent more time gambling, they spent more time thinking about gambling. So servicemen and women are not, not necessarily distinct from the, the general population and being at risk to getting deeper into gambling problems um, as, a, as, a, as a result of COVID. But again, unlikely to have taken it taken out gambling um, as, a, as an activity um, solely due to COVID. It was likely that there was a, a susceptibility of vulnerability in that, that uh, group of people uh, prior to the pandemic. Thanks, Simon. So we are fast coming towards the end of this panel. So I think we've probably got time for one more question. Sadly, we couldn't get Justin to join us, uh, which is a shame because he has an incredibly powerful story to tell. And I would encourage people to, to Google him because he is quite prominent online. Um, but the question that I will put to both Simon and Maria, which has come in, and I think it's a good question to end on. If this research could lead to just one change, what would it be? Um, maybe Simon, I'll come to you first. I uh, imagine you sort of probably have lots of ideas with your research hat on. Um, screening, routine screening, routine screening, and targeted um, uh, individualized facilitated support for those who may be um, getting into difficulties within a supportive, anonymized um, framework. I think that would be the most obvious implication. Yeah. Okay. And the same question to you, Maria. Yeah, no, great question, and I think you know for. Is as we've discussed, if this increases the um, the understanding, knowledge, um, um, exposes more people to awareness that they, there could be a problem, um, just triggers in a few people to look out for those signs. I think that then those are those are all really helpful things. But what I would say as well is, is um, I think this research, um, the panel, the ability to to talk to um, the Health and Wellbeing Committee about these, these problems just shows how closely we work with the RAF Benevolent Fund and uh, and how much we appreciate the support and help that we get from the fund um, in looking after our people. And we've seen this with the way in which the fund supports us over in other areas as well, not least things like the Headspace Mindfulness app and the, um, the youth counselling service for our younger people. So loads of ways that we work together. So I think this has been a fantastic opportunity for us to celebrate that close partnership that we have with the fund. Yeah, definitely. I echo that. Great. Well, thank you. Um, thank you both. That brings the Q&A session to a close. Um, any outstanding questions will be answered in person via email. Um, thank you all so much for your engagement. The research report should now be available to view in full on our website at rafdf.org forward slash gambling report. Uh, so that's it from me. And I'm now going to hand back to Chris to say a few final words before we close. It's such a shame that we didn't have Justin joining us and my thanks to Justin who I know you've been in the background of battling through technology issues like we've all done in many Zoom teams and other device calls that we've had through COVID over the last 18 months or so. But also my sincere thanks to those that have joined us today and for making space in your busy diaries and for your participation in the great questions that we've just had to the panel through the question and answer session. And we do hope that you found it a useful insight into gambling and well-being in the Royal Air Force. So what happens now? So we do believe the Royal Air Force has an opportunity to lead the way across the Armed Forces community in its response to these findings. And we look forward to the continuing partnership and conversation with the Royal Air Force as we work together to take forward the outcomes to this piece of research. In particular, we are calling for the increased awareness among service personnel, increased screening, training for health professionals and line managers, and education, and that low intensity uh, behavioural change strategies that you heard about in the question and, uh, uh, question and answer panel session for those who are at risk of developing gambling problems. For us here at the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund, we just keep going. Our work doesn't stop here. We are absolutely committed to making sure we anticipate future needs 
of our, our royally enforced community, that royally enforced family, including through research such as this, but also ensuring we're here for the serving personnel wherever they need us. The Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund offers a wealth of wellbeing services, from counselling and a 24-hour emotional support line, to funding the headspace that you just heard Maria mention, and working with Camp GAM Care to provide training on Royal Air Force stations. To all of you, please continue this conversation. It's so important that we use what we've heard and learned today to speak up and to speak out about something affecting real people and families and to help make a positive change. If you have any further thoughts, please do, me, do email them through. But for now, thank you all very much once more. And I do look forward to seeing you all soon.